Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending November 5th. First up, we have a huge asteroid. Now they're calling this, the article's calling it a huge asteroid head for close encounter with Earth. I don't know what most people consider huge, but this thing is approximately a quarter of a mile in diameter, and it's going to be 200,000 miles away from Earth when it comes by. Now that's still closer to us than the moon but you're talking about the moons at 250,000 miles away so it's going to be within 50,000 miles of the moon the asteroid's name is the full name is 2005 YU55 but for the article they just call it YU55 and when you're talking about the fact uh some people were saying well what if it strikes the moon is it going to change the orbit or anything like that think of this as a size comparison 2000 miles versus a quarter of a mile it would be the equivalent to maybe going out to a, a brick building about 40 foot by 40 foot and shooting the building with a BB gun. You're going to uh, maybe take a little chip out of a brick or something like that, but if you were to measure the other side of the building and how much you moved that building by shooting it with a BB gun, I doubt you would get anything even detectable. You probably wouldn't even get so much as a vibration. So that's what we're talking about. They say that amateur astronomers are actually going to be able to track this thing despite the fact that it's blacker than coal itself. So it's a very dark object, but evidently if you're an amateur astronomer and you have the right kind of telescopes, uh, you should be able to actually see it yourself. They uh, said the Hubble telescope can't move fast enough to be able to track it. This would be um, a spectacular event to see though if it did actually hit the moon. Uh, you probably would be able to, at least uh, more powerful telescopes would probably be able to actually see the impact. But they said even the, the best impact that could possibly be set up with this thing, if it were on a trajectory to hit the moon, which it is not, uh, it still would not leave a crater that would be anything close to the largest craters the moon has on it. So um, still something spectacular because I think in all of history there was maybe one other recorded event where possibly... Um, people actually viewed an impact onto the moon of an artificial or of a non-artificial object. Um, so that would be something really cool to see. Next up, this was sent to me by Cash Store One, so I want to give credit for this. Um, it's about a new engine design. It's an engine design where it's two pistons coming together and uh, coming together in the center of the engine and then you have the uh, de the detonation of the um, fuel mixture and then the uh, pistons move apart opposed and the nice thing about this type of design and I'll put up uh, a little bit of the video the whole video I'm going to give you the link to down in the bottom as I do to every article but the nice thing about this is you have two masses in opposite directions as the pistons both move apart they're moving in opposite directions and as they move together so the uh, there's no need to uh, put any kind of external devices on this engine to balance it. It's like perfectly balanced from the start and with the masses moving opposite. The real cool thing about this, it's not a new design to have pistons coming together in the center. That design, I've seen those before. In fact, uh, the first chance I got to um, hear about that kind of design was a person that was a naval engineer that worked on uh, ship motors and he's telling me about those type of engines. But if you notice on this one, there is no typical piston connecting rod that moves back and forth as the piston goes up and down. All the mechanism connected to the piston piston stays basically uh, moving in place with the uh, piston itself and not articulating back and forth which causes piston slap. In a normal engine as your piston goes up and down inside the engine the other end of uh, the connecting rod to the piston is connected to your crankshaft so it wiggles back and forth and you get a thing called piston slap. The piston itself starts jiggling at high RPMs and because of this particular engine design you don't have to worry about that so that you can run it at much higher RPMs and get more power out of it. So I kind of like that on the design and as you can see the actual crank shaft itself is on either side. It's not connected directly to the piston. Um, it's on either side of the engine so that that kind of design is, is really cool and I think maybe it would be something you keep thinking that uh, the piston engine is finally going to uh, be dead and uh, someone else comes up with a new design to kind of keep it keep its life going for a while I still think we're destined in the next 10 years to turn to electric motors for powering vehicles and I hope it does go that way but it's cool to see people design something that can keep the piston engine alive and maybe uh, give it a, a little bit of extra efficiency or a little bit extra power for the lifespan it does have left in it. And next up, uh, this is a video I want to feature and I'll um, give the link to it in the bottom too as usual. This is from SRC401. He's doing a test and, and I like it because he's, he's 
obviously doing it the right way. He's doing a very good test of a substance called a gasoline additive called Ecomax. And um, it looks like by the video in his description that he doesn't have any specific interest in it or he's not making any money from this product. He's just trying it as a user and giving a comparison of uh, if it really does what its claims are. And the claims are that it, uh, um, as usual, f uh, things that you add to your fuel mixture, they claim to uh, make your engine run cleaner. They uh, claim to leave less deposits. But the real claim with this is it also extends your mileage. And so he's doing a test and giving his results as to whether it extends his mileage. And uh, uh, another thing when you want to look at these kind of mile and performance too, he said also um, it's supposed to increase performance. And he said he did get some detectable in increase in performance. But the thing you always have to keep in mind too is the price of the product. Now I looked up the price of this product, Ecomax, and it runs for about $24 for a 120 milliliter bottle. And if you were actually to use it to treat 10 gallons of gas, um, besides the cost of the gas, it would add an extra $4 to the cost of the gas. So you would have to get enough extra increase in your gas mileage of about 11% to have it pay for itself. Not counting the fact, now some people would say that's not the, the main point. If the main point, if it gives you enough extra performance, maybe it still would be well worth it. And I can see that argument. I mean, people um, that have the old type of engines and old hot rod cars, they um, pay a little bit extra to get the octane boost and add that which does seem to be effective in boosting your octane so the engine will run without detonating and they don't do it to save money they do it to get the performance so that's a factor too so you have to decide between the performance if it actually gives you the performance or if it actually gives you the extended range in your gas mileage whether this is good but th getting around to the subject I wanted to touch on I would like to hear from people either in the form of video or comments what engine additives have you found to be actually effective? Uh, two specific ones that come to my mind are um, Prestone radiator stop leak. I've used that many, many times and enough to really feel confident in it. Uh, I had leaking uh, seals on my water pump and I've actually used that to get by until I had the money to make a repair by adding that to the engine and it doesn't seem to have any effect as far as uh, plugging anything up or causing the engine to overheat. It seems to work really well. Um, as a matter of fact, one time I used it and I thought pretty much it solved the problem permanently, so I flushed the radiator, then the vent hole on the water pump started leaking again, and then I put some back again, and then it stopped it again. So obviously it didn't solve the problem permanently, but while it was in the engine itself, it did stop the problem. Um, the other engine additive that I have used is uh, Dura uh, Duralube for engine oil. There's another treatment that was similar to called Slick 50. I think they're both basically the same thing, and it... Um, impressed me when I saw the commercials. They would take an engine and they would run the engine and then they would, um, after this treatment, they would dump all the oil out and then they would start the engine up and keep it running again. And on one demonstration, they not only did that, they took the radiator off, uh, take the radiator hose off and emptied it of all the radiator fluid too. And uh, the engine just kept running and running and running. And the reason why I really like it is it actually worked for me one time when uh, an oil, an O-ring seal failed in an oil filter and my wife ended up driving our um, Plymouth Horizon from our house to work nine miles with no oil in the engine and the same thing coming back home from work back home and uh, when she told me about that the oil light had come on I went to the driveway and saw that all of the oil in the engine had basically been pumped out all of it was laying there in the driveway and the engine had been driven 18 miles with no oil in it whatsoever but it had the Duralube treatment and all I basically did was change the oil filter, put oil back in it, and the car never gave us any problems whatsoever. Never sustained any kind of uh, damage or made any kind of strange noise or anything. So um, I would say probably uh, Duralube, Duralube works excellent in my opinion, and uh, Slick 50 being the same kind of product, I've heard people say that it's it's basically the same type of thing. Um, it's one, you know, either one of those I, I would recommend, but specifically the Duralube because it did actually work for me. So if you have any kind of products like that that you've actually used and you know for a fact they work, um, please let me know, especially things that are that are more than just a one-shot deal. I mean, a lot of times you'll add an additive and you'll think that it did something, but just as a one-shot deal, it really doesn't give you a, a, a really good perspective on whether it works or not. So um, I would appreciate it if you'd leave it in the comments if you have anything like that that has actually worked for you. And finally, I would like to give a shout out for two different events that are going to be starting up in just a few weeks. One is the Polar Bear Challenge and one is the Solar Bear Challenge. The Polar Bear Challenge is motorcycle riders that like to ride and make vlogs 
at below 32 degrees or below zero degrees centigrade and the other is an event where it's called the solar bear challenge and it's for those people that live in the warmer climates or it can be even the people that um, live in the colder climates too there's no really restriction on it as far as temperature wise but it's just writers that uh, make videos during the winter season and have a lot of fun I think the uh, Solar Bear Challenge has a little bit funnier components added to it. I think they're going to add some things that you do on your motorcycle and things that you do for um, different events of the challenge. They're going to make it even a, a little bit funnier than the, the Polar Bear Challenge, but even the Polar Bear Challenge can be um, kind of funny depending on the particular person anyway. So if you get a chance, both of those links will be down below. Check out either the Polar Bear Challenge or the Solar Bear Challenge. You don't have to have anything to do with motorcycles to watch and, and enjoy the videos. So. That's it for this week. Take care, everybody, and I will catch you next week.